Coming up next on the Connecticut Network, P.T. Barnum in his lesser-known role as legislator and civil rights activist. I'm Diane Smith. Join me for this latest installment of And Justice for Some, Race and Controversy at Connecticut's Old State House. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Sally Whipple. I'm the Director of Education and Community here at the Old State House, and we are very happy to have you with us here today um, for the second presentation in our lunchtime series called And Justice for Some, Race and Controversy at Connecticut's Old State House. The series provides glimpses into the lives of Connecticut citizens who wrestle with issues of freedom, race, and equality throughout the 19th century. It explores their triumphs and their failures and shines a light on the role that this building played in shaping our state. Judges, juries, senators, representatives, governors, and citizens all practice their powers of persuasions within these very walls and played a part in making decisions, both good and bad, that shaped our state's history and led us to this point in time. Today, our job at the Old State House is to remember the actions taken by past citizens and to encourage all of us to learn from their examples. I'm happy now to introduce Diane Smith, who will guide today's discussion. Diane is best known for her popular series, Positively Connecticut, and her weekly magazine series for Connecticut public television called All Things Connecticut. Her dedication to our state and its stories and the example she sets as an active and informed citizen makes her a perfect partner for Connecticut's old state house. And we're very happy to have her and all of you here today. So please join me in welcoming Diana. Thank you for being here today. It's very nice to see you. I want to uh, say thank you particularly to legislators who came over uh, from the Capitol and to uh, some of the employees of the uh, state of Connecticut and to everybody who took the opportunity to leave their offices for a few minutes and come join us for a little bit of history. Um, I'm Diane Smith and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, in the idea of trying to get you in and out of here within a reasonable amount of time for lunch, um, we're not planning on taking questions for the panel during the program so that people can leave as they need to, um, but you are all welcome to stay and talk to our panelists uh, after the uh, formal part of the program wraps up, and it is being taped for CTN. So, um, as you are about to discover, Phineas Taylor Barnum was more than the greatest showman of his era. He was a man of vision, a man who saw what America could become in the new industrial age, a man who wanted his city of Bridgeport and his home state of Connecticut to be on the cutting edge of this evolving society and the new prosperity that it would create. As you're about to hear in that quest, P.T. Barnum would take on the roles of Bridgeport mayor, Connecticut legislator, meeting right upstairs, urban developer and community benefactor, as well as philanthropist, abolitionist and author. Barnum was committed to the intellectual and cultural development of the city of Bridgeport. And more than that, he was committed to justice for the citizens of Connecticut, regardless of their race. He would have liked Kathleen Marr, the executive director and curator of the Barnum Museum. Since joining the museum in 1998, Kathy has been an advocate for Bridgeport's revitalization as a vibrant cultural and business center working with the city of Bridgeport, state historic preservation officials, and the National Park Service. Kathy has been a leader in ensuring that the Barnum Museum becomes a recognized national historic landmark. Kathy Marr has followed in P.T. Barnum's tradition. She is a person making a difference. She is a person who is positively Connecticut. Please welcome Kathy Marr. Thank you so much, Diane. Actually, I, I've never considered the fact that would Barnum have liked me or not, so I'm very happy to hear those words out loud. Um, yes, I actually have um, not just the job at the Barnum Museum, but I have the privilege of being the uh, steward of P.T. Barnum's extraordinary history. And, has any, and the first thing I like to do is, that, has anybody been to the Barnum Museum before? 
Okay. And you might recognize it today, and T.R. Rowe, certainly his office overlooks this. Exactly. Um, so sorry. <laughs> Not getting away from work today. Well, when the Martin Museum opened in 1893, this is what it looked like in downtown Bridgeport. Wonderful uh, stone building with terracotta friezes that if you look up at the upper edge, it tells the story of Bridgeport's, um, Bridgeport's historic past. Pictures of the Industrial Revolution, the Civil War. So even in Bob's architecture, that incidentally he did not survive um, to see completed, he embeds the history, the story of American life and social uh, and industrial development within the architecture of his building. Now, today, a few of you have been to the Barton Museum, and I hope I welcome all of you to come back again. But most people remember P.T. Barnum with the service, of course. The fact of the matter is that P.T. Barnum was 61 years old before he got involved in the service that we understand today. He had a life of extraordinary opportunities and challenges, um, and the circus really culminated as how he invested his interest after retirement, could you imagine? And pointing out to what Diane said, uh, P.D. Barnum passed away in 1891. For over a hundred years, the man exhausts me like nobody else, so I'll try to keep this as concise because he had an extraordinary, long, and very, very busy life. Now, Barnum uh, was born in Bethel, Connecticut in 1810, and it was a time in America that society and ideals and morals were emerging. He basically defined himself with a Jacksonian democracy. He believed in civil rights, he believed in the common good, the authoritative voice for everyone, everyone to be equal. And this was the definition that he really built uh, within his character. So his early life basically focused on, you know, freedom of speech giving people the opportunity. Most of us associate him with the art of the humbug. Well, during the 1830s, 1840s, American society was enormously different, and you didn't have opportunities to make your own decisions. Audiences, the way we understand them today, didn't exist. And it became Barnum's charge to discover what people wanted as far as entertainment was concerned and development and ideals. And this wonderful Courier and Ives image really embodies P.T. Barnum. And you can see the ladder of success showing morality. Um, um, temperance was a huge part of Barnum's life. We'll get into that a little bit later. Industry, ingenuity, these were all uh, models and characters that Barnum felt that a man could possess, any man could possess, and have an enriched and fulfilled life. Now, he did start out as a shopkeeper in Bethel, and he realized that farm life in Bethel was not for him. He was 12 years old, and he got the opportunity to go on a cattle herd to Brooklyn, New York. And it was his first taste of New York City, the metropolis, that he felt had the energy and the excitement that fulfilled his need um, in society. And one thing that he recognized, too, when he was in Bethel, he was very political-minded. And he certainly was putting these ideals out, and he would send editorials to the Danbury newspapers, who regularly would not print a word of Barnum's, um, Barnum's story, whatever it might have been. So Barnum, finding his ingenuity very late in life, he goes, I'm going to start my own newspaper. And he did. In the 1830s, he began printing his own newspaper called the Herald of Freedom. And we have a number of copies in the collection, and it is words and words and words of values and principles and ideals uh, printed and distributed, which became extraordinarily popular. However, what did happen on a number of occasions, he was sued for libel. People did not necessarily like what he said. And the last time that actually happened was um, a, a libelous comment by our standards today, very minor, but Barnum was actually arrested and put into the Danbury jail for these comments against a minister who, later in life, turned out to be his daughter's father-in-law. Interesting twist. The people of uh, Bethel actually disagreed with this jailing of Barnum, and uh, after two months in, um, in the jailhouse in Bethel, the town decided to throw a party for him upon his release. And this is actually a lithograph of the party and the parade that was held for P.T. Barnum when he got out of jail because they felt that there was not justice in his jailing and a celebration should be had by all of the public. 
Now, the one thing that happens during this time is Barnum was not really an itinerant showman. People think that he traveled around with circuses at that time. He did on one occasion, hated it, didn't like it at all. However, people got their entertainment in these remote regions by shows coming into towns and moving to the next town. One show that captured Barnum's um, imagination was a woman who was billed as the 161-year-old nursemaid to General George Washington, Joyce Heth. She reeked of antiquity. She was very wrinkled, she had no teeth, and she would sit in a little chair arranged for her and she would regale people with stories of little George nursing him on his knee. She would sing songs. It was fascinating to people and they would come and come to see her. He didn't care whether the public really believed it or not. This is how he bought her and this is how he promoted her. What turns out after a short time with Joyce, and incidentally she was a slave and he emancipated her upon her purchase. So she was not um, an enslaved, she was an employee. Um, she passes away. And an autopsy is, you know, uh, considered by the press as let's do an autopsy on Joyce Heth. Barnum was like, sure, do an autopsy on her. As it turns out, the autopsy is performed, and Joyce Heth is reported by the surgeons to be only 88 years old. Barnum says, I bought her. She was 161. That's what they told me. I had no way to, to tell. But with the Jacksonian America, it wasn't the truth that was critical to people at the time. It was the experience. It was the opportunity. And to a Yankee Connecticut, this opportunity was spectacular. And this was the type of entertainment that Barnum focused on and said, this is where I want my future to bring me. So it brought him right to New York City. And if you know anything about Lower Manhattan, the American Museum was right on Broadway by Pearl and Ann Street, and it was Amer uh, Scudder's American Museum at first. Barnum purchased it and reopened it as Barnum's American Museum. It was monstrous. The American Museum had everything, and a lot of people think about what, what was in it. Everybody thinks of uh, freak shows and sideshows. It actually was not that. Those ideas are more ours. It's much more of a 20th century construction of Barnum's, uh, Barnum's history. Hence the mythology that we talk about. The American Museum was a miraculous place, and it showcased, yes, human curiosities, but what was also in the museum were historic relics, uh, all types of technological innovations. A sewing machine was fascinating, a, a perfumery, there were wax figures, there were everything from Live animals, believe it or not, were really predating the idea of a zoo. So the menageries, one the most famous was the happy family, where all types of birds and animals and monkeys were in one large cage as a happy family. And later, uh, Mark Twain talks about that. Um, but it was really a collection of all types of entertainments. Now, one thing that Barnum does see, and actually this is a, a lithograph of the saloons. They were called saloons. Um, one thing that Barnum does recognize with opening the American Museum, too, is audiences at the time were not what we understand today. Audience in the eight, really pre-1840s were predominantly attended by men. There was no entertainment mechanism for women and children. Barnum recognized that's an audience that I could tap into. He actually, perhaps not creates, but popularizes the idea of the matinee. So all types of entertainments were opportunities for women and children to come. It was wholesome. It was moral, going back to those ideals of his Jacksonian principles. So he would have all sorts of entertainments that were appropriate for women and children to see during the day. And one thing that he did do in his saloons, he did create a moral lecture hall, and there would be performances of Romeo and Juliet watered down, nobody dies. Later on, they did Uncle Tom's Cabin, again, with a happy ending. I've never seen the script. However, but these things that were palatable to an American sensibility. And this is actually a litho of uh, the Moral Lecture Room, where they would see wonderful, fascinating entertainment. So Barnum understood that he was building fascination with a New York population. And actually, it's reported in the 1840s that more people were visiting Barnum's American Museum that actually lived in New York City at the time. So it's an extraordinary amount of attention he was getting. Now, perhaps the most, and interestingly, um, Barnum finds out about Charles Stratton through his brother. Charles Stratton is the only Bridgeport native, really, that we talk about in the historic part of uh, the Barnum Museum today. 
He comes to Bridgeport, he meets Tom Thumb, he's five years old, he's fascinating, he's engaging. Barnum actually negotiates with his parents to bring him on a major tour, not only of the United States, New York, but also all over uh, Europe. As it turns out, Barnum sees, like, all right, the entertainments that we're bringing really need to heighten in elevation and uh, station. It's a point in American history, too, where you're very conscious of how you're being perceived. And Barnum wanted to be seen as more than just a huckster with Joyce Heth. He wanted to be, really be perceived as an impresario. And this is the channel that he's going on. Now, Tom Thumb meets Queen Victoria. He meets all the crown heads of state in Germany and France. Actually, he does little characters. Again, it wasn't as if Tom Thumb was a shy, sideshow entertainment. There would be a stage or furniture. He would engage with people. They were called levies at the time. And he performed various characters. He would come out as the uh, gladiator. He would, uh, the, the funny story is that he did Napoleon as well, which was wonderful for the English, but the French did not like Napoleon. Um, so he would actually engage that way. Now, the one thing, too, that Barnum did realize, he, he's friends with a gentleman named Moses Kimball out of Boston, a, a Boston Museum comparable to the American Museum, just never got the notoriety Barnum had, um, perhaps because Moses Kimball did not have the acumen for marketing and promotion the way Barnum did. But Barnum borrows what's called a Fiji mermaid, didn't invent it, uh, and brings it to the American Museum. And they have got huge broadsides on the American Museum showing a gorgeous mermaid found at the, near the Fiji Islands. It's spectacular. Come and see her. 25 cents to get into the Barnum Museum, uh, American Museum, not a dime museum. Uh, and you could stay all day. Added attractions did not cost you more. And incidentally, I'll point out, too, it's right around now that Barnum is regulating the audiences to the point where if men drank or smoked, it was absolutely prohibited. You could go outside onto Broadway and have your drink and smoke your cigarette, but you had to pay to get back in, no matter what it was. So that's how he regulated. Now with the Fiji mermaid, people are fascinated. They're actually going to come. They're going to see a mermaid alongside the other, you know, aquarium exhibits in, in the American Museum because there were aquariums and whales inside this museum in New York City. And they come and they see this. Barnum leader says, oh, perhaps that wasn't one of my better exhibits. The Fiji mermaid really becomes that. Now, a lot of people what, uh, wonder what happened to the Fiji mermaid. There were a lot of them, uh, a lot. There were quite a number of Fiji mermaids out there. Uh, it's presumed that it did go back to Moses Kimball's collection. And today, there are two housed in the Moses Kimball collection at the Peabody in Harvard University. So we do believe that it still exists out low after all these many years. Now, going back to the human curiosities, and I always like to point this out because we do think when we hear human curiosities or freak shows, you think of Coney Island. It didn't really have that sensibility. And going back to Barnum's belief that people were equal, people should have opportunities no matter what their race, their religion, or their disabilities might have been. So some of, or many of, not all, of the curiosities in the American Museum did have disabilities. and they found opportunity at Barnum's Museum. It's a piece of this we don't think. In the 1850s, in the 1860s, what types of uh, opportunities did people have that did have disabilities? So there was actually opportunity to collect a salary and a wage and perform, and Barnum even roomed and boarded his, um, his performers, his entertainment, his cast. Chang and Ang are perhaps some of the more popular ones, the bearded lady that we all know. I love this one. These are the wild men of Borneo. They're so wild. I always, the gentleman sitting on, on your right, I'm always, I, I don't even sit that straight. And these were billed as wild men. So it wasn't as unusual. Barnum did not allow photography in the museum. He sent them across the street to Matthew Brady's studio, where these cabinet cards would be, um, would be developed, and then they could be sold. So everybody's really in a position of being rather sophisticated and elegant. Um, another fascinating curiosity in American society at the time were ballerinas. Ballerinas, singers of refinement. We did not see that in this country yet. It was established you know, in, in Germany and Austria at this time, but not here. So you would go to the American Museum and you would have the opportunity to see a ballet. Brand new. And of course, very, very appropriate for a women and children audience.
Now, the one thing, too, that I point out, which is remarkable, when Barnum looked at the world, he saw everything exotic as fascinating and wonderful, and he wanted to bring it. You couldn't go to it like we can today, whether it's on an airplane or on YouTube. Um, so he had to bring everything into uh, New York City. And another part of the human curiosities that he would bring in would be families or people from different countries, whether it would be China, Japan, Germany, wearing traditional clothing, speaking their language, doing their dances, whatever it might have been. So this was fascinating for American public. And I always remind people, it's like, well, what do we call that today? Today we call that Epcot. So we're really doing the same thing in a different model. Now, as I mentioned, Barnab loved the exotic. This is actually a painting in the museum's collection of uh, Iranistan. This was the mansion that P.T. Barnum had built uh, in Bridgeport and Fairfield, very big property. And this is a picture of one of the installations of the museum today, that if you come, you would actually see um, some of the objects that Barnum donated to the museum from Iranistan. Now, again, I go back to him wanting to point to the civility and the refinement of his character. And in doing that, one of the most um, important things that he accomplishes is bringing the hailed, the acclaimed Swedish nightingale, Je Jenny Lind, to New York City at the time. Jenny Lind was a spectacular performance, but again, in this country, it was really not known if it was going to fly. So Barnum recognized the fact that he couldn't sell Jenny Lind because she was a genius uh, at, at musical entertainment and performance. He knew American society and how to promote it to, him, to them, so he built Jenny Lind's enormous popularity on the fact that she was an enormous benefactor of orphanages, musical academies, that she gave to fire departments. Everything philanthropic that you could possibly imagine is how he loaded and saturated the market to get people to come and see Jenny Lynn perform. Now what happens is she comes, Barnum negotiates the deal uh, to give her $178,000 excuse me, $187,000 in a banking firm in London before she would even pack a petticoat. Now this is in 1850, and he did. He managed to secure the money. She came, they toured for about nine months. They opened, believe it or not, on, in Castle Garden, where you get the ferry today to go to Ellis Island. Uh, the date was September 11th that she opened. Over 30,000 people crowded the Castle Garden area. 10,000 seats were established, and he, and he basically managed to code all the seating because there were so many people that were in charge. Now, it's 1850 that Barnum actually recognizes the fact that the Democratic Party is on the ascend, but the problem is the advancement of safe slavery. He was very aware of what was happening politically and the Nebraska-Kansas debates that was going to allow the perpetuation of slavery, overturn the Missouri Compromise, was a problem. And it's at this point in his life, he actually refuses the nomination for the governor of Connecticut for the Democratic Party because he did not feel that the movement of the party was going in the right direction. It's not actually until the Civil War that he does change his party to Republican, for reasons, of course, to abolish slavery. And the American Museum continued. Relics from the Civil War were actually showcased uh, from different skirmishes. And one thing that Barnum did recognize was people had to get their minds off it, just like today. We need to get away from the TV sometimes. And the uh, marriage of Tom Thumb and Lavinia Warren occurred during the Civil War. And Barnum said, it's a point that we can distract at least New York from the horrors and the images that were coming out of Civil War reports. Um, so the fairy wedding, as it was promoted, the company was actually photographed in all their wedding attire before the wedding. Uh, Lavinia Warren's dress was on display at the American Museum weeks before the wedding, so people would get excited. It was not mayhem, uh, mayhem and chaos. They had tickets. Anybody who was anybody in New York City at the time was invited. You had to have a ticket. People were trying to buy tickets. Barnum wouldn't have it. It was extraordinarily controlled. Abraham Lincoln sent his regrets. He could not come because he was detained by other matters, but sent gifts to the fairy wedding. So it was spectacular, and it took people's minds, perhaps momentarily, off the, um, the ravages of the war. So Barnum recognizes the fact now it's time 
to do something, to live up to all that I've been preaching about. And he does decide to run for the um, legislator for the town of Fairfield, actually, gentlemen, um, in 1865. And I'll just read you what he basically says. It has always seemed to me that a man who takes no interest in politics is unfit to live in a land where the government rests in the hands of the people. So he felt, even though he was a party man, but he wasn't partisan, he was not a wire puller, that he would really continue uh, and try to pursue being a politician so he could work to abolish slavery. Now, slavery, the 13th Amendment was, um, it, it wasn't ratified yet, but the 13th Amendment was in play, as uh, the 14th Amendment was also coming up where it would broaden citizenship. So Barnum believed in these principles and r really wanted to advance them, not only in Connecticut, but certainly on a national level. And he was so offended by the uh, Nebraska-Kansas issues of advancing slavery, it became time. Now, he gets elected in 1865, and actually in this building right here, and it's going to be a little creepy because uh, I just want to read a couple of his words that were said uh, in 1865 in these, uh, in these chambers. Well, perhaps not these chambers. But he recognizes the fact that Connecticut had to be more progressive, and he fought to eliminate the word white from the Connecticut Constitution, and he wanted to support voting for all men, which then became the 15th Amendment. And he says in these chambers, Mr. Speaker, I am no politician. I came to this legislature simply because I wish to have the honor of voting for two constitutional amendments, one for driving slavery, slavery entirely out of the country, the other to allow educated men of good moral character to vote regardless of color of their skins. To give my voice to these two philanthropic, just, and Christian measures is all the glory I ask legislatively. I care nothing for whatever for any sect or party under heaven. As such, I have no axes to grind, no logs to roll, no favor to ask. All I desire to do what is right and prevent what is wrong. He spoke for an hour and a half. Apparently, the Senate adjourned so they could come and listen. People tried to heckle him uh, away, and it would not... It would not work. He spoke eloquently. As it turns out, uh, the amendment to the Connecticut Constitution did move forward. However, it was killed uh, during ratification. And that actually does not occur until 1876, some 11 years later. Now, in the State House, as you can see, this was more for, for Sally because this is an image that we did have from the 1960s. Barnum had other issues uh, as well. When he got here, he recognized there was an enor enormous problem that was starting to emerge in Connecticut. He did take a position on the Agricultural Committee, and this is a rather fun image that kind of combines these two things. Now, anybody here tell me, on his property in Bridgeport and Fairfield, uh, at the accounted time, he would have a gentleman dressed in exotic clothing uh, and a train schedule for the New Haven line. When the train was scheduled to pass, they would pick it up and they'd start plowing the fields of the Iranistan mansion. Well, I'm going to tell you, if somebody was doing that today, I'd stop and look. And it was all the idea of promoting the American Museum. Well, interestingly, even though he was on the Agricultural Committee and did say he deserved to be there because he plowed fields with elephants, um, he got here and he recognized what was happening, which was a huge impact on this country. Commodore Vanderbilt, who we all know, the major railroad baron, was trying to corner the Connecticut market uh, and a monopoly was being established. He saw this already happen on the Harlem lines and on the Hudson River lines. What was really happening were mansions, as we all know, were spotting up all over uh, the Hudson River. And the idea was wealthy people that were working on Wall Street had cheap fare that they could get uh, up to their uh, homes up the Hudson without any type of, of uh, challenge or over cost for moving out of the city. Well, as it turns out, Vanderbilt decided to raise those weekly and commuter fares two to four hundred percent and not raise any of the freight lines or day trippers proportionately. It was just targeting those very specific people. Barnum saw this happening in Connecticut with the New Haven lines and he fought them tooth and nail. Uh, the movement was to elect um, a railroad interest lobbyist to the Speaker of the House. He fought it. He won. It was not easy. Uh, they went on and on on a daily basis. Ultimately, he won. 
But he also had the foresight to see before legislation went in, it gave Vanderbilt the opportunity in Connecticut to say, okay, we got to raise the prices on those rails now. Barnum made the bill retroactive two weeks. So he slid it in and he protected the common man in that case. So it was a, a, a re resounding success. Now, what basically happens, as he's speaking on the railroad interests in this building, a notice slipped to him, uh, which really is from his um, son-in-law down in New York City, that the American Museum was completely burned down. Uh, and he read the paper, he folded it, he proceeded to finish. He won the legislation that he was speaking on at that moment, and after uh, the, the session had adjourned, he went back, he showed the note to a few of his colleagues, and it was horrifying to them that he was able to finish, succeed, and then deal with his life. What actually happens, as it turns out, about a year before, in 1864, there is a hit list. Twelve buildings in New York City are cited uh, for a terrorist attack, so to speak. Barnum Museum was on that list. Nothing ultimately happened. However, when the investigation was done on the American Museum, it was determined that the fire broke out in three places. And it became uh, acknowledged in the New York Sun that the American Museum was burned down by Southern sympathizers, mostly because of Barnum's passionate appeal for abolition. He rebuilds almost immediately, and one of the main reasons he rebuilds is because over 150 people are out of, out of work at the time, and he wanted to make sure that they had the opportunity to proceed. The Musical Academy in New York City had a fundraiser for all of these uh, people, and the new museum opens. It's in 1867 where he has the opportunity now to run for a congressional seat, the 4th District. Um, he believes, okay, I'm, I'm going to throw my hat into the ring, we're going to try a congressional race, and it turns out that he's running against a very distant relative named William Barnum. Turns out it was a, um, there was a lot of um, citing that there was fraud, that there was ballot counting and corruption, and Barnum was rather pleased that he did not really win this, uh, this congressional seat, and he sees it as, uh, he was a universalist, he sees this as, it's the right thing that actually happened uh, in 1867. He could focus on his businesses, not be pulled to Washington on greater matters. A lot of the um, uh, Reconstruction Amendments are already in place at this point, and he's, he's able to get past that. But then what ultimately happens in 1868, the Second Museum also burns down. It's not reported to have been uh, by Southern sympathizers, but a boiler room blow up. I didn't mention, too, that that beautiful building, Iranistan, it only existed 10 years in 1857. That, too, burnt down. So he was riddled with fires. And it's really because of this that there was no municipal fire department in New York City at the time. A lot of these were just small independent fire companies that were charging to the rescue. Barnum was one of the founders of the New York City Municipal Fire Department. Now, I'll go quickly because I know we're running out of time. Yes, we are. Um, just to point out, sucker born every minute. Everybody says, oh, Barnum said it. Barnum actually didn't say it. It was, um, to, to sum it up quickly, it was a gentleman from Syracuse who was a staunch atheist and challenged the Bible. In doing this, he actually had carved out of gypsum a giant naked man that they would put in the earth because there were people who said the Bible was literal. Everything that was word for word in the Bible was true. So this person just perpetrated this hoax. He had this giant statue carved. They stippled it. They aged it with acid. They buried it in the ground in Cardiff, New York. Uh, a year later, they staged its finding. It's a sensation. It's all over the newspapers. Trains are bringing people from New York City. They're selling sandwiches on this. They're making a fortune. Well, somebody leaks that it's a fake, and Barnum thinks that's hysterical, and he wants to borrow it and travel it. They said, no, we've sold it to Syracuse businessmen. Barnum said, fine, I'll make my own. Barnum carves his own Cardiff giant and is touring it in New York City at the same time. Well, who's making more? and having more instruction. Barnum's, of course. So an injunction is put on P.T. Barnum, and the judge is like, you got to be kidding me. You want me to stop him from faking your fake get out of my court? 
and the Syracuse business person said, see, there's a sucker born every day, but I will tell you this, if you go to the State Museum up in, in uh, Cooperstown, New York, the Cardiff Giant is there, but now it's going to cost you 10 bucks to go see it. <laughs> Still working. Um, right now, we've got a mummy uh, in our collection. We're doing fabulous research on it. It was donated to the museum by Barnum's second wife, Nancy Fish. Um, it's wonderful. The last time you folks came to the museum, it was probably a boy. We've found out through modern CAT scans that it's a woman. And what is wonderful about the mummy is the fact that the antiquity of it um, tells so many different stories. And we know from our friend Mark Twain, Barnum and Mark Twain incidentally were friends, um, that the uh, book Innocence Abroad, if you've read it, Barnum, or excuse me, Twain was traveling with one of Barnum's advanced people and he was directed to buy Barnum mummies for anywhere between uh, $1,500 and $15,000, in which case Mark Twain was, I wish all my ancestors were mummies because I'd certainly sell them and get some compensation. But um, you can't quite see that. We finally get to the circus idea. Barnum opens in Brooklyn, in New York. He's approached by Midwestern circus promoters to revive his, um, his enterprises. And he opens uh, in April in 1871 under a big tent. Barnum actually has the tent patented. And over 10,000 people would go to the, uh, go to the shows. He wanted to reestablish another home, move uptown. Manhattan was starting to move uptown. And he opens the uh, Hippotheron and the Hippodrome, later to be known as Madison Square Garden. Barnum does marry his second wife, Nancy Fish, and then he becomes mayor of the city of Bridgeport, he decides. And what people don't realize is he had very strong interests. He wanted to, to make sure people had the opportunity for fresh water, that the gas lines were going to all houses, not just the big houses. Huge temperance leader, as well as regulating on prostitution. So it was a strong control. Uh, mayoral seats at that time were only a year. So he didn't affect great change in that short period of time, but it is reported that there was a full resolution to give him a rounding sound of applause for him and his administration. And whether he, we liked it or not, we're not quite sure because Barnum filled his desk with flowers at his last council meeting. So Barnum then later, after his mayoral position, and I'll, and I'll finish up because I know we've, we're on a time line. Um, he does decide in 1867 to run, uh, excuse me, 1877 to run for the legislative seat for the city of Bridgeport. His interests at that point were strictly temperance. He was speaking all over the country with the Red Path Lyceum on uh, the evils of alcohol and his issue at that point was the reformation of liquor laws and he was enormously successful and held two terms focusing on those issues. The greatest show on earth emerges, our friend Mr. Bailey comes into play later on in his life, only three years before he dies is the first time he lends his name, he combines his name and he really addresses himself, his long and busy life. Uh, in the state from, from the Jenny Lind enterprise to his legislative issues and his speech in this house. And then he does give uh, quite a bit of money to the city of Bridgeport Seaside Park, um, the Bridgeport Hospital, and he does basically set up the Barnum Institute of Science and History, where I am happily employed. And then his last years were not so quiet. We do know that his last words um, he wanted to know what the receipts were at Madison Square Garden. So his resolve was most certainly to the very end, and his passions were extraordinary. And I'm just going to sum up with not even my words. Oh, and I'll, I'll point out too, uh, believe it or not, Barnum does die, James Bailey continues the circus. It's not until 28 years after Barnum dies does the name Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey get combined. And had he been alive, I can most certainly assure you we would be celebrating Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Brothers today. He would not have taken second billing. But Neil Harris, who's perhaps one of the most wonderful scholars of Barnum, sums it up most eloquently for this program. And he says, Barnum began his career as society began its own existence. As an act of criticism, he ended it as a yaysayer. Its transformation was inevitable. Few carried off so much enjoyment or demonstrated so conclusively the involvement of politics of entertainment with the politics of life. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Kathy. We are really excited that we're able to help kick off the 200th anniversary of Barnum's birth. And while our uh, panel is being configured, I just want to uh, make a couple of notes for you. Uh, I don't think Barnum would forgive me if I didn't mention that we have special Barnum-related things on sale in our gift shop today, um, which is right across the hall. Also, I want to let you know that we have two more lectures scheduled for the winter. On February 2nd, we will have Dr. Robert Wolf from CCSU talking about the Amistad. One of um, those trials took place in this room. And on March 3rd, Karen Peterson from the um, Connecticut Commission on Culture and Tourism will be speaking about our state heroine, Prudence Crandall. You can check our website, ctoldstatehouse.org, for information about upcoming programs. And you can also check the Connecticut Network um, website, ct-n.com, to find out when this program will be airing and when it will be available online. That information should be available tomorrow. And now I would like to send the program back to Diane Smith. Thanks. I've heard Kathy Marr speak before, but she's never caused me faint. <laughs> that was quite a, an interesting program, so thank you. Um, I, it's my pleasure now to uh, begin the second part of our program. And that is, uh, since part of the mission here at the Old State House is uh, to join history with the present, is to bring some of our lawmakers here and discuss how the role model of P.T. Barnum and the issues that he cared about at the time that he was elected to the House uh, affect us today and how we are still inspired by them. And I'd just like to introduce you to both of them. Senator Ed Gomes was first elected to serve as a state senator from the 23rd Senatorial District in a special election on November 14, 2005, and was overwhelmingly re-elected in November of 2006. Senator Gomes has said that his mission in Hartford is to continue his lifelong fight for social and economic justice for all. He grew up in Bridgeport and enlisted in the Army in 1958 and was stationed in Virginia for a couple of years. At that time, Virginia was a segregated state and Ed experienced life under racial segregation when he was off the military base. That inspired much of his later work in life. He was part of the historic March for Jobs and Freedom held in Washington in 1963, and that had a profound effect on him. Ed got involved in union activity as a steel worker in Bridgeport. He served that union and the AFL-CIO throughout the years. He was a city councilor in Bridgeport and was part of a group that filed a federal lawsuit that challenged the racial inequity of Bridgeport's city council districts. Um, he also uh, was, in 2002, joining forces with the Brennan Center for Justice, the Connecticut Citizen Action Group, and Common Cause Connecticut, and successfully challenged Connecticut's primary system. So um, a couple of the issues that have been important in shaping our government in the last few years. State Representative T.R. Rowe was first elected to the Connecticut House of Representatives in November of 1998 has since been re-elected five times. He represents the 123rd Assembly District, which includes most of the town of Trumbull. Uh, Representative Rowe is a trial attorney at the law offices of McNamara and Kenny in Bridgeport. He has a general law practice with an emphasis on insurance defense and personal injury litigation, and really, I'm fine. I just, I'm fine. Um, but he also has the advantage of being able to look out the window of his office and seeing the museum that uh, Kathy is the head of. So uh, he does have P.T. Barnum on his mind uh, throughout the day, at least when he's looking out the window. As a member of the General Assembly's Influential Judiciary Committee, Representative Rowe is an advocate of strong anti-crime and victims' rights laws. He believes strongly in the rights of the unborn. He is the chairman of the Regulation Review Committee, and he sits on the Select Committee on Housing. Um, and he says that he has witnessed firsthand problems that affordable housing mandates have created for people in his district. He calls himself a strong fiscal watchdog and has consistently opposed tax increases and is involved in revising Connecticut's tax policy. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us, and Kathy, thank you. Um, Kathy talked about how P.T. Barnum was focused 
on running for the legislature because of a particular issue that motivated his passion. And that was really his, his uh, strong feeling as an abolitionist and his feeling that <clears throat> African-American men should be able to vote. Do you feel, Senator Gomes, that there was an overwhelming driving passion or interest that drove you to run for the state Senate? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, me running for the state Senate was somebody else's idea. <laughs> <laughs> Some people uh, got together and they felt like they should be a, a state senator, and I went along with it. Um, previously, even when I ran for the council, um, back at that time, it was 1983, we were trying to elect a black mayor in the city of Bridgeport, mm -hmm. and I was associated with him. I was running a voter registration drive, which was the most immense they ever had. And um, during that time, the, uh, the person who was running, Charlie Tisdale, said, you should run for councilman up in 136th district. I resisted. I told him I'm no politician. And um, a couple of months in the campaign, he convinced me to run, and I won. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of my political career. Mm -hmm. My whole, um, everything I did in uh, my adult life was based on uh, unionism. And mm -hmm. I was an international rep for the United Steelworkers. And, and that's how I really got involved in the politics, because I became a legislative coordinator for the state of Connecticut, for the uh, for the um, steel workers, mm -hmm. and that's how. Thank you. But it, I, as I progressed and um, got involved in things, uh, I've become very interested in politics. Mm -hmm. Yes, because of that. T. R. Rose, state representative. Um, I understand that your interest in politics goes back to high school. That you were working on uh, election campaigns for uh, local legislators uh, when you were still uh, cracking the books. Yeah, I did have that, um, the love or the, um, you know, the bug for politics and current events and just government in general. You know, we all have our um, things that we're interested in. And, you know, my first goal was to, to play shortstop for the New York Yankees. <laughs> and that didn't work out. Um, but I, I just loved uh, love politics. It was. It's. I don't have a political background in my in my pedigree. You know, I'm an Irish uh, Irish Slovak uh, who had no one uh, no one in their in their roots that that was involved. But it fascinated me, and uh, it, I guess it sounds a little cliche, but I just thought that in a small way at least I could offer something and um, you know make make life better. Every, whether it's on a local level or a state level or beyond uh, for folks. Um, Senator, uh, we talked a little bit, Kathy talked a bit in her speech about um, the 13th Amendment and um, how this House and legislature reacted to it. Uh, when you think about the kind of debate that went on here, does it reflect the kinds of things that still go on in the legislature today? Well, some of them. Um... Now, uh, when we talk about the 13th Amendment, of course, there was an um, amendment, uh, um, uh, really, it was really one of the first civil rights amendments, mm -hmm. um, and recognizing the African Americans. But um, you say, does it reflect what goes on in the House mm -hmm. now? And, well, not as much as it did back then, but um, it, it's, it was a precursor to everything that, that goes on right now. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel, um, uh, now clearly P.T. Barnum when he ran and when he held this office felt that he was making history, that he was shaping this state and this country. Do you get that sense still today in the legislature or are the issues not as monumental? Well, uh, I, I feel that he did because uh, at that time it was one of the most important issues and, and Lincoln himself emphasized that that was the issue that he, he, he based his... Um, his presidency on, presidency on, and, and uh, have Connecticut, for him to lead Connecticut into the fight, I think was quite, quite monumental. Kathy, if there hadn't been a, a figure as huge as P.T. Barnum who took up that particular cause, where do you think the debate in the legislature might have gone? Would it still have ended up in the same way? Connecticut was very challenged um, and was drawn, and actually, it's a very good point, um, Connecticut did not ratify the 13th Amendment. And as I had said, and, and in doing that, it really did not ratify the Connecticut Constitution to acknowledge the amendment. And it took 11 years prior. It actually took the 15th Amendment in 1870 uh, to be ratified that really overturned Connecticut's position. So it had to be constitutional 
um, to move Connecticut forward. And as I said, Barnum never let go of his Jacksonian Democratic principles. Um, and he, he stood to those, but he could not get past the issue of free rights, civil rights for all, and, and as well as women's suffrage as well. Um, being being on the same um, social network as um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Mary Livermore and the women of that time, so he he, although was criticized for so much in his life, he defended the ideals and the morals that he held from his youth, but recognized that he had to adapt to move the country forward, and hence becoming a Republican. So I always say I can work both sides of the aisle. So, uh, <laughs> well, Representative Rowe, that's an interesting uh, subject. You mentioned to me when we spoke earlier that you come from a family of Democrats. Um, you're a Republican. Um, are there issues strong enough today in our state legislature that could cause legislators to jump parties? Or do we see that more in the case of, uh, for instance, I would say um, in the federal government, we see it with Arlen Specter. But did he jump parties because of a deep feeling of wanting to belong to the other party, or did he jump parties because it looked like a better way to get reelected? Don't say anything about that. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I haven't, I didn't talk to Senator Specter about it, but I suspect, uh, and I've gotten a, list, a little bit less idealistic as I uh, catch up to Ed in age here, but, um, uh, no, I'm, you got a long way I, to go. I think, <laughs> I think in terms of changing party affiliation, I think that's a political decision, political expediency for the most part. Um, the ideological differences between the two parties are, are profound sometimes, but uh, frankly, more often than not, uh, they're very similar. If you look at the number of the amount of legislation that uh, we vote on, I would guess that maybe 70% or 80% of it is, is practically unanimous. Now, those may not be the weightier issues, uh, but it still does cover a, a good portion of it. So I don't see, maybe we can, we can convince a couple Democrats to come over uh, to the Republican side, but um, for the right reasons, which would be more ideological. Yeah. But I tend to think that when one does jump, uh, it's, it's at least in part because of political expediency. You're smiling, Senator. I was thinking about a couple of Republicans on our side. We could solidify our veto process, yeah. override vetoes. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, we're managing the way we are. With yeah, them. I noticed. <laughs> Kathy? Well, I think it's a good point, too, because one thing that really has not changed historically is the wave of, of popular ideals at any moment in time that would be a shift, whether it's democratically or Republican. And during uh, Barnum's run for the congressional seat, uh, he clearly knew that there was a wave of democracy that was going to really be more pervasive than the Republican ideals. Even Mark Twain writes a parody about Barnum running and that he should stick to the happy family sort of ideals. And it was more in jest and more biting. And people think, oh, could that have been the reason Barnum lost? As wonderful as Mark Twain is, it perhaps wasn't. There was a real uh, communal interest in the fact that the Republicans were interested in maintaining an eight-day work uh, an eight, excuse me, an eight-hour workday, mm -hmm. and that was just not palatable uh, to the voting market at that time. So it was demonstrated that it was a complete Democratic win mm -hmm. across the street, and that's probably more the reason uh, why he lost. He was caught up in that legislation. Mm -hmm. Senator, uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to highlight Barnum uh, at this discussion here in the old State House is because, in many ways, he became a role model for other people in taking up causes, in running for office, in um, comporting themselves to the legislature. I I'm curious, uh, because of your long background, both in union activity and in civil rights work, if there was someone who was your role model in that way. Hey, Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph, um, little, little do people know that A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin were the organizers for the 1963 march. And, um, and A. Philip Randolph was a, a very prominent uh, person, in, uh, not only in the civil rights movement, but he was um, prominent in, um, in uh, unionism. In 19, I guess it was um, before Roosevelt died, he got, un um, he, he, through a, a rally that he had in Washington, he got um, 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 FDR to 
to integrate uh, the, 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 um, the plants, um, you know, and the federal plants um, where you worked. And in um, 1948, I guess it was, it was during um, Truman's administration, he got them to um, desegregate the Army. Mm -hmm. Not only that, um, A. Philip Randolph, I mean, he organized the sleeping car porters. He worked for 12 years to organize the sleeping park, car porters against the Pullman industry. And um, he was just my, my hero. I got to meet him. I got to sit down with him and buy at Ruskin in the past. And Norm Hill, who ran the Institute, uh, A. Philip Randolph Institute, and I was involved with them quite a bit. I was, uh, when I became an international rep for United Steelworkers, I was the first black representative in the whole New England district, and I became the civil rights coordinator for the, civil, uh, for the um, um, district one, which was all of New England. Mm -hmm. So I was deeply involved in the civil rights movement. And the reason why I was at the 1963 march, that was my last year in the Army in 1963, and I was stationed at Walter Reed Army Hospital. So I was right there. I was lucky. Representative Rowe, um, was there a single role model or a series of role models who inspired you to, to want to be part of public service and, and government? Well, I grew up, in a lot of my formative years, President Reagan was, was president, mm -hmm. you know, from 80 to 88, and uh, he had, I think, a reasonably profound influence on how I viewed uh, government uh, and the importance of limiting the role of government to increase uh, freedom. Uh, and, and liberty, and it may sound a bit glib, but uh, I do think that uh, the country has in many ways uh, restricted our freedoms as government has grown, and so I, I, I see some conservatives, mostly Republicans, as, as, as being important in the battle to, to limit the growth of government in so much as it, it inf infringes on, on liberties and personal freedom. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you mentioned that uh, P.T. Barnum was not particularly fond of politicians, yet he found it necessary to run for office several times and yes. to hold office several times at different levels. Yes. Um, what does that tell you about uh, the person? It, it's remarkable. It actually really speaks to all of his ideas. He, he believed that, that equality was necessary for everyone, and he had, got to get, had to get past the fact that he referred to them as oily politicians, um, <laughs> that there was corruption, that there was this, there was that. Not my words, his. Um, and he needed to, to steamroll through and make sure that the right battles were being fought, the right battles were being won. And it was his obligation to, to those that much is given, much is expected. And he felt that it, it was really his obligation to give back and fight the charge, you know, spearhead these issues that he held as, as strong beliefs. And he had enough public juice, really, to be that person. He knew it. He absolutely knew it. And he, like no one else, could work the media and the press to get the right words out. Uh, and interestingly, he created um, he created the voice for Americans. He created a place where people could actually speak their minds. And the fact that he was able to bring it to Connecticut and uh, and certainly to Bridgeport as well was was sheerly calculated. Um, was exclusively calculated by him. He knew he knew he had the ability to do it, and and he was remarkably successful. He ha it wasn't easy. His words do not suggest his battles were easy, but um, but he did serve. He believed he was there to serve. Did you want to respond to that, Representative Rowe? Well, I think uh, he's a fascinating study, and I think uh, as much as I my office is across the street from the museum, and I've been there a number of occasions. I learn something every time I, I talk to Kathy or I, I read or hear about Barnum. The thing that, that I think many of us take away from it, Kathy even mentioned it, when he was giving an impassioned plea about, uh, about, about black suffrage and slavery, um, there were hecklers. And uh, whether it was this very room or you know, certainly this building, um, it's not easy to um, give a speech or, or hold to the courage of your convictions when you're getting hooted and hollered at. And whether he saw the big picture or whether he simply had the purity of his conviction, uh, I suppose it helps when you're reasonably wealthy and you have a built-in audience of supporters, as, as he did. Nonetheless, 
it is very easy to get caught up in the mainstream mm -hmm. and the going along and the getting along. And those that can fight that tide are often vindicated, uh, whether it's uh, that year or generations later. The fact that he took that stance uh, is, is commendable and really ought to give many of us, particularly politicians, pause for thought. Well, I think I'd like that to be the last word, because I think that's a good note to end on, a, a pause for thought. I want to thank all of you, the three of you, for being here, Senator Ed Gomes, uh, Representative uh, T.R. Rowe, and Kathy Marr, the Executive Director and Curator of the Barnum Museum. I thank all of you for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to have you here at our beautiful old State House. I hope you'll look for the program if you uh, would care to tell your friends. It will be uh, carried on CTN, and we're very glad to have you with us. Um, I'd also like to invite you, if you'd like to stay, to talk to our panelists. We'd love to have you do that too. Sally? Great. Thank you very much, Diane. And thank you to everybody. We invite you to stay and talk, and we invite you to cross the hall and see a small exhibit that we have called Want Change, which features citizens from Connecticut who affected change. And I would like to thank again Diane, Senator Gomes, Representative Rowe and Kathy Marr from the Barnum Museum and our team here at the Old State House for everything that everybody's done to bring this day together. And thank you, too, to you, the audience. We really appreciate your coming today.